Today I'm talking about rights and liberation, and I'm going to start by talking about humanism. A lot of people consider themselves humanists. Let me know if I'm being unfair to the philosophy, but humanism seems to be predicated on a certain view of the individual as inviolable, endowed with rights and responsibilities, and a certain view of social institutions and how they're supposed to uphold your rights. But why does everything have to come back to rights? What if the right you want isn't available? I'm not a humanist because I don't believe in its premises, like rights, and outside a courtroom, I don't think it's useful to talk about rights. I think we should focus on liberation as opposed to rights. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. Before we go on, this video is sponsored by Chrisbase, the great new way to buy cryptocurrency from It Had To Be Said Finance. What you do is, you send me your money, then I send you the equivalent in Chriscoin, which all the cool kids are investing in. Then you can spend Chriscoin anywhere it's accepted, and I'll spend your cash. Anyway, we were talking about rights. Humanism, like its cousin liberalism, tends to rely on the institutions that claim to uphold rights, like states, you know, the government, and pieces of paper that say you have rights, like this one. Unfortunately, like most of today's philosophy, humanism assumes all kinds of premises without having proven them. It assumes states can serve the will of the people including protecting their rights. It assumes what we call democracy is democratic, or can be with the right reforms. It assumes rights granted by official institutions are the ideal. Most modern ideas largely ignore the origins and purposes of social institutions, how they shape our thinking, how they prompt us to make certain decisions and restrict us from making other ones. Everything humanists stand for can be argued to exist already, like human rights, secularism, and liberal democracy. I see the spread of humanism as more of the same. Humanists also believe in science and reason, which is great, but without a wider critique of systems, they won't understand the extent to which science is guided and limited by power. They might say, I'm going to become a scientist and cure cancer. And the market says, there's no money in that. So you spend 40 years trying to make watermelons bigger and more slippery. Reason and logic might help scientific progress or see through certain arguments, but it can't guide the building of a better world. You need ideas and imagination for that. Nor do I think reason can be used to find the correct or universal morality, the rules that will apply to all people at all times. It's not necessary to find universal truths and rules if we aren't forcing everyone to abide by them. Considerations like rules and morality will always be influenced by a variety of factors, and thinking everything can be figured out through science would mean ignoring most of them. You can use reason to make moral judgments for yourself, but how would you know what's right for everybody? You can try to force others to live by your morality so they're no longer free to make moral judgments, but restricted to the morality imposed on them. What we believe is shaped by our culture and the people around us, but also by the systems we live under. If we're told it's morally correct to follow the law, and we never question that, all our moral judgments will come back to the law. And that's where rights come in. Part of the problem with rights is we don't agree on what they mean. I think we like rights because they feel like rules that protect you that no one can violate. But realistically, they can be violated at any time. We love to assert our right or the right of someone we like to do something as if it meant anything, as if saying you have the right to something brings it to you. 
closet. No, 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 absolutely not. No, you, you, you guys can't take away my right to choose. Oh, you want to go there? I do want to go there. My body, my choice. It says so in the Constitution. If someone's attacking another, you can assert the second person's right to be free from unnecessary harm, or however you would frame it, but that doesn't stop the first person from attacking them, unless by some miracle they're swayed by your argument. The point is, power overrides rights every time. That's why power shouldn't be concentrated so it's impossible to resist, but dispersed. Not centralized in a state, but decentralized in everyone. Equally in everyone's hands, rather than solely in the hands of a few. You can come up with your own ideas for rights and see if they catch on, but for the most part the conversation is led by the state. A small group of men claiming to represent millions of people, write down what rights you're allowed to have. The same people will suspend your rights whenever they decide their interests are threatened. They will decide what actions you are allowed to take without facing the threat of violence. Legal or political rights are just temporary permissions from your rulers. The U.S. has interpreted the First Amendment to the Constitution as the right for corporations to donate as much as they want to political candidates, but not to stop police from beating up nonviolent protesters. If the interpretation of rights and how to implement them is left in the hands of people who are unaccountable to you, like police and judges, you shouldn't expect to have any rights. But even if there were a state that protected all the rights it grants you, the fundamental problem hasn't changed. Other people are deciding how free you are allowed to be. A lot of rights seem like liberation, but because they're granted by the state, they are to the state's advantage, not to your freedom. You have the right to vote. Well, <laughs> I don't know, some people do anyway. People say voting is governing yourself, but it isn't. It's having a tiny measure of say in who governs you. And, well, you know what that means. People say voting is democracy and democracy is freedom, but you only ever have freedom to the extent the state allows it. And if your freedom can be taken away at any time, you're not that free. So instead of having the right to have a tiny say in who governs millions of other people, you should govern yourself. No one will grant you that right, but you can take it and defend it. It's the same with everything. You, you have to ask permission from the state to be allowed to do things. Why not just do them? Why does everything have to be so indirect? Why do you have to ask for permission? I don't want the right to have my voice heard, as politicians love to say, but to have the things I want done. Since my voice alone doesn't usually get those things done, I would rather just do them. That would be liberation, independence from external systems. I'm gonna keep coming back to liberation as I contrast it with rights. I've been told I have the right to a fair trial, but it's only fair by the state's standards. Are the laws that I'm accused of breaking fair? Should they even exist at all? Is my lawyer good enough? Are the police and judges fair? Are they ever? How about punishments? It's easy to hand out punishments if your word is law and you won't face any consequences. Either way, it doesn't matter if I consider it fair or not, because I don't get a say in what's fair. Just like calling the judge your honor assumes they're honorable, the system defines its trials as fair. So any trial you have under this system must be a fair trial. Some rights can be really vague. We have the right to self-determination. Well, what does that mean? It's never had a clear meaning. In fact, that's pretty much why it was coined, to tell people who didn't want to live under empires anymore they had the right to self-determination, which didn't mean they were free from imperialism, but that perhaps 
certain steps would be taken in the fullness of time to give them some kind of autonomy within the overall framework that they were compelled to adhere to. In other words, they get a longer leash. Vague rights leave room for interpretation, but it's not you who interprets them, is it? It's a judge. To a judge, or a nationalist for that matter, you already have all the rights you deserve. You could say you have the right to self-determination, and people could tell you you belong to a country, and that country represents you somehow, and that is self-determination. Well, I don't want that then. I want liberation. You can say rights are more complicated than what the state says. After all, there are whole philosophies like humanism behind them. Rights and laws and morality aren't necessarily considered the same thing. But the main success of those philosophies is to have been co-opted and codified by the powers that be. Rights are now baked into the state's pretexts for ruling over you. So now it's just assumed the whole purpose of the state is to defend your rights. It doesn't matter if they actually do, as long as their subjects think that's how it's supposed to be, because that's what the state told them, they'll believe it until they're forced to conclude otherwise. Like every other idea that becomes influential, rights have become a tool for legitimizing power. People ask the state to uphold their rights, i.e. do what it claims to exist for, instead of liberating themselves directly. Whenever you place your freedom in the hands of someone who doesn't actually have to do what you want, or even what they promise to millions of people, they're not going to be very responsible with it. They take it, and they don't give it back. And they don't have to. Until, that is, there's some kind of uprising and the state is forced to make concessions, like changing some of the people in the seats of power, creating a new department, passing new legislation that sounds fine. The effects of the concessions might even last for a few years. But over time, the people and parties you liked get pushed out, the department ends up working for the people it promised to protect against, that's called regulatory capture, by the way. And the legislation you liked gets repealed or watered down or just goes unenforced. It happens every time. Trade unionists, socialists, and anarchists fought and died to create a more equitable society in the U.S. at the beginning of the 20th century. Their revolution failed, but as a result of the pressure they put on the system, the government created a bunch of social programs that people take for granted today. But they've been weakened over time. Fighting for rights takes pressure on the powers that be. You have to squeeze them to get any juice out at all. I don't like hearing people say they demand their rights from the state when they don't have a threat to back it up with. Why would people with power over you give you rights if it means they can't do things to you anymore? Why would they give you freedom if your freedom means less of their power? It's not really a demand if there's no threat of what you're going to do if your demands aren't met. And by the way, threatening to vote for someone else is no threat at all to the wealthy business interests and other pressure groups who control politicians. Real pressure on people with power, like riots and looting, not voting, could lead to a temporary replenishing of the programs and rights won a century ago. But probably not for very long. It doesn't change the relationship between ruler and ruled. While there's still oppression, your rights could fly out the window the minute you turn your head. Another way to look at rights is as something that costs money. You have the right to food and shelter if you can afford them. Otherwise, property rights trump human rights every single time. In fact, you have the right and freedom to go anywhere and do anything, as long as you can pay for the tickets, the accommodation, the passports and visas, the legal fees, etc., etc. 
Rights are a carrot on the end of the stick that keeps you going to work. Maybe rights are for between civilians of the same class, when the state has no stake in the outcome, like, a, like in small claims court. But then, I mean, we have arbitration for that. Even better, in many places in the past and to this day, people who did wrong to each other were sat down to plead their cases to the adults in the community, who formed a kind of jury. That's something you could bring back as part of self-governance. Rights and constitutions could be useful for your community or your organization as a kind of agreement you opt into with consequences for breaking it. Everyone joining this organization has to agree to these rules. I mean, that's normal, right? How about uh, all members have the right to feel safe around other members? If they don't feel safe, this, that, or the other happens. You can use the word rights in this case, but I mean, you could just as soon use words like rules or governance. If we think of rights this way, we don't have to hope unaccountable institutions like the police and courts will grant us rights. It's you and the people who know you, whose liberation is most tightly bound to yours, who enforce rules or rights, so you don't have to worry about punishment for victimless crimes or accidents. You'd get infinitely more sympathy and understanding and opportunity for reconciliation than you would from an impersonal legal system, which might make for a fairer trial. I don't know how you would protect rights otherwise, though. Since we're all subject to propaganda, it's normal to start your activism with rights. Activists mount campaigns to demand the state uphold people's rights, or add more rights to the political documents. But I think we need to think beyond appealing to the state for rights it's reluctant to grant us? What if you don't have the right to free yourself? What if how you think is the right way to free yourself and your people is illegal? It is, by the way. I guess we'll have to just remain under the thumb of power forever. Or we could liberate ourselves. The great thing about liberation is it happens on your terms. Your liberation means freeing you in every way you choose to be free. You do it with however many people you want, possibly even on your own. Well, that's, that's a lot harder. It doesn't need to be written down and approved of by someone else. There are different ways of thinking about liberation. It could be taken spontaneously, maybe in some kind of uprising, as I talk about here. But it could take much longer. Ask a feminist. Feminism has made a lot of progress, but it's taken centuries, and it still has a long way to go. And liberation is not just about the body. It's not just opening the door to the prison so you can walk out. Nelson Mandela, after 27 years in prison, wrote... As I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. And Harriet Tubman said she could have freed a thousand slaves if they'd realized they were slaves. Wait, what? She didn't really say that? Oh. Well, point still stands. Not everyone realizes they're not free. Liberation means freeing your mind from restrictive thoughts and ideas before, during, and after your physical and economic emancipation. It means refusing to be dominated and refusing in turn to dominate others. It means working with other people as equals, equal in self-governance, not trying to rule them or make money off them. Some people demand their liberation, but that's not how it works, because no one will grant it to you. You have to take it. It's up to you to free yourself, and to do so you need to know how you're oppressed or dependent. I can't tell you that, although I have some suggested some ways that all of us are oppressed in this video here. Some of the usual suspects are the threat of laws, police, courts, and prisons, the constant pressure of needing money, 
stress from bosses and customers and deadlines and waking up to an alarm clock, along with whatever other pressures you face, whether from parents or the broader culture, to be someone you don't want to be and spend the time the way other people expect you to. So what's the difference between rights and liberation? Rights are granted to you by someone else, if you're lucky. Whereas liberation is freeing yourself however you see fit. Thanks for listening. Before I go, here are the topics I didn't get to this week.